our atramentous mother wombing our star-fed earth with darkness. Ah, the great celestial uterus. <laughs> I'm going to leave that there before it gets weird. Regular listeners will have noticed that so many of the characters in It Is Rocket Science are men, deceased men, highly accurately revivified. <clears throat> well, you know, it's a gift. Highly accurately revivified through the medium of the voice. Why? You may have pondered. And then you may have twigged. You cannot libel the dead. <laughs> But is this not also true of dead women? Yes. Though they tend to live a bit longer on average. <laughs> At least according to science. In this episode, we take to the skies with the women whose wings have clipped the heavens. Women who have gone into space and those who fought to go. In the 1950s, doctors working with NASA considered an elite group of female pilots for spaceflight training. Few remember now, but they were celebrated in the fine American press of the time as Lady Astronautesses, <laughs> Astronautrixes, and upstart harpies who ought to get back into the kitchen where they belong. <laughs> and this brings me to your host for tonight. <laughs> Comedianette, writeress, and space enthusiatrix, please welcome Helen Keane. Hello. Uh, welcome to It Is Rocket Science, the series that takes a low-budget, highly subjective look at the history and future of space travel. And with me, as always, a masculine mechanical marvel, adjusting the gender balance like a Ukrainian election monitor with a monkey wrench. I built him myself, the voice of space! Hello. This, then, is a history of female astronauts, or, as some radical feminist theorists insist upon calling them, astronauts. <laughs> This is a very important episode for me because I find when I say that I'm a feminist, people make associations. They think, oh, right, frigid, plain, man-hating. Yeah, that's my fight today to prove those things are all just a coincidence. <laughs> now, I know female pioneers of aviation and space travel might get some of you thinking... Like, why would I be interested in a load of boring ancient times lesbians or whatever who, like, achieved stuff? I want to know about Pippa Middleton and celebrity labioplasties. But we say, steady on there, stereotypical woman's our listeners. You might just be surprised. Now, it's odd. Just to get this out of the way before we begin, men and women who travel into space are depicted very differently in popular culture, and they wear distinctly different quantities of clothing. Think of the iconic images of great spacefarers of science fiction. Great women such as Barbarella, <laughs> roaming the universe in a bikini. <laughs> Princess Leia, rebelling against the Galactic Empire in a bikini. <laughs> Ripley, fighting the alien and providing science fiction with an enduring, self-reliant female protagonist in tiny pants. <laughs> this doesn't happen so much with men in science fiction, except possibly He-Man. By the power of Grayskull, I'm in my pants! <laughs> but think of other great male heroes, such as Captain Kirk, Buck Rogers, Luke Skywalker, all fully clothed, unlike their female counterparts. In space, as in stand-up comedy, men and women clearly are a little bit different. Felt like we were on a date in space, yeah, girls? And he was like, you know, wearing a space suit that maintained the pressure of the gas particles in his lungs, and like, I was, hello, dressed casual, you know, big hair and tinfoil sex pants. <laughs> and he's all like breathing a supply of oxygen and protected from extremes of temperature, and I'm all like, Wait, <laughs> how can it be so cold and yet my eyes are boiling out of my head? <laughs> What's with that, huh, ladies? This is all the more bizarre when you consider the proud history of female aviators. During World War II, both the Allies and the Axis powers produced astonishing female pilots. For instance, in Germany, there was Hannah Reutsch. Jawohl. 
I am the first person to fly a helicopter indoors. I test flew rocket planes. Basically, I'm probably one of the best pilots who ever lived. I snicker in the face of death. Ha, 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 ha. But these days, no one knows her name. Why? Is it because the world is and always has been very sexist and still not able to cope with a woman who outperforms her competitors in a male-dominated arena? Hmm? No! It is because I totally, totally love the Führer Hitler. And even in the 1950s, was always saying things like, the Germans are not sorry about the war. They are only sorry they lost. <laughs> Perhaps not the best example to start with. <laughs> but if few people know about Hannah Wright, still fewer people have heard the story of the group of elite American pilots who were considered for astronaut training, who began to prove themselves but then were barred for consideration for space flight because they were women. It is the 1950s, the golden age of healthy consumerism, traditional family values, and paranoid spying on people you think could be commie pinky leftovers. A decade where men were men and women were Christina Hendricks. <laughs> The real purpose of the rockets, originally developed by the Russians and the Americans, was to carry warheads across the seas, not passengers into space. In the US, relatively small redstone rockets could lift relatively light warheads, but with very little spare capacity. Would they be able to launch an astronaut and the necessary life support? For the American space program, like a guess how much the cakeways competition at a Weight Watchers meeting on a bus balanced half on half off a sheer precipice, <laughs> every pound counted. <laughs> Then, an idea began to form outside the box. <laughs> As indicated by that sound, women! Could women be the answer? Yes, if the question was, who has the advantage of being on average 8% smaller and 15% lighter? And who, in laboratory tests, have also been shown to breathe less oxygen and produce less bodily waste than men? And I think we can all agree the bodily waste test would be an embarrassing one to fail. So, yes, your vital signs are excellent. Blood pressure is 120 over 80. Even during extreme G-force testing, your reactions are exemplary. But then we saw your bodily waste. <laughs> Acres of it. <laughs> Where the hell did that come from? However, when Werner von Braun, the man behind the Apollo rockets that sent man to the moon, as well as the V2 rockets that destroyed buildings across Europe, was asked whether there'd ever be a female astronaut, he said, Male astronauts are all for it. We are reserving 110 pounds of payload for recreational equipment. <sighs> what a sexist! I don't know about you, but that attitude completely puts me off the former Nazi party member and SS officer Werner von Braun. <laughs> But ex-space Nazis were not the only people hanging around NASA with a less than positive view of women's abilities. NASA Chief Medical Officer Chuck Berry, yes, his real name, <laughs> told a conference that women would have to go on space trips too to provide sexual diversion. And then presumably he went on to mention his dingaling. Um, <laughs> but not everyone thought that way back then. And one of the people who didn't think that way was Dr. Randy Lovelace II, who sounds like he ought to be... Hey there, ladies. <laughs> I'm Dr. Randy, and I'm going to take you all the way to the moon. But who was actually... Former flight surgeon Randy Lovelace, chairman of the NASA Special Advisory Committee on Life Science with a key role in the astronaut selection process, ma'am. He began, unofficially and without NASA entirely formally on board, to give the best female pilots in the country the same tests as the male astronaut candidates. Lovelace found that women actually performed better in some of the tests than the men, particularly isolation tests, where they massively outperformed the male candidates. Anyone would think that the women in 1950s America were completely used to feeling alone and trapped, unable to escape the rigid confines of their environment. <laughs> yeah! Are you listening, the patriarchy? Mm. Or do you go straight to sleep after book at bedtime? Mm. Thirteen star candidates emerged who'd later be dubbed the Mercury Thirteen. Ah, Randy Lovelace. I'm determined to solve the problem of payload weight by considering every possibility while pioneering the field of space medicine. He was nothing if not a free thinker, just like his namesake, Ada Lovelace. I am working on an algorithm to be processed by a machine, and thus I shall be acknowledged the world's first computer programmer. And Linda Lovelace. <laughs> uh, I really 
regret this one day, won't I? <laughs> so, back on track. Randy Lovelace II was not afraid to think outside the box. But when the media found out about the tests he was carrying out on astronautesses, their reaction was inevitable. The LA Times said, The spaceman is sure to retain his interest in having a female companion aboard, even if liquor loses its appeal. Unless, of course, she turns out to be a nagging backseat rocket pilot. <laughs> This was a new industry that was making its rules up as it went along, but there was a problem. One rule had already been decided upon. Astronauts needed to be military jet pilots with combat experience, and women in the American military weren't allowed to be either. That wasn't always the case everywhere. The Soviet Union had several successful all-female fighter squadrons in World War II, whose prowess and almost uncanny bravery during raids in darkness saw the Germans dub them the Night Witches. But NASA refused to let Lovelace continue his testing program at their facilities. The women of the Mercury 13 did everything. They toured the country speaking on the subject of female astronauts. They addressed Congress, but they couldn't make any headway. Then, only weeks after Congress had rejected them outright, the Soviets made an announcement. On the morning of 16th of June, 1963, Comrade Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman to orbit the Earth. Once again, the US press rose to the occasion. She orbits over the sex barrier. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Valentina spent nearly three days in space, longer than all the American male astronauts put together. As Khrushchev gleefully put it, There is your weaker sex. But after Valentina's flight, no other women were to go into space for 19 years. And the first American woman to actually pilot a spacecraft was Eileen Collins, who flew the space shuttle in 1995, 33 years later. The surviving members of the Mercury 13 attended the launch. It was delayed several times, when an incredulous teenager exclaimed, T minus six minutes? As the takeoff was stopped yet again, one of them muttered under her breath, Try T minus 33 years. The story of women in space of the Mercury 13 isn't straightforward. It's too long and winding to tell properly here. It isn't simple. It doesn't really have a feel-good ending. But once you hear it, it haunts you. Mae Jemison, the first black woman in space, said, Never be limited by other people's limited imaginations. Space travel has always been the realm of the imagination. It's an irony that it was a failure of imagination that lay behind NASA's idea that space just wouldn't be for women. In the 1950s, NASA imagined hydropods on the moon, vast wheeling space stations, bizarre plants and animals on other worlds. Drugs may have been involved in that last one. <laughs> But women in space? Still today, all across the world, who knows, maybe the universe even, men and women and beings whose genitals we might not even begin to recognize and hence have expectations about what that means for what they can do, are imagining, sometimes purely to escape, but sometimes just to see what it would be like if someone like them was allowed to do something like this. All any of the early would-be space women of Mercury 13 wanted was a chance, a fair chance to show what they could do, because they'd already proved themselves tough and capable. They could have succeeded, and succeeded, and succeeded. That really isn't hard to imagine at all. It is Rocket Science, starred Helen Keane, Peter Serafinowicz, and Susie Kane. The show was written by Helen Keane and Miriam Underhill, and the producer was Gareth Edwards.